as I said, I don't introduce people because I'm terrible at it. So I'll let you guys introduce yourself. I'll mute myself. You can go ahead and share your screen. Sure thing. And we can get started. Uh, that's what I'm going to do something. I'm just going to stop our video here so that we can get all parts of the parts of the presentation in. Um, yeah, so thanks, Derek. Um, thanks for the introduction and allowing us to do all of this, uh, allowing us to talk. And thanks for everyone joining uh, for this talk on, on these incredible birds. Carrie and myself, well, my name's Kyle. This is Carrie next to me. Yeah, we've both been working uh, on this species for the past five years now, and are currently both students at the Fitzpatrick Institute of African Ornithology. I'm in my final year of my PhD, and Carrie is about halfway through her master's. Um, each of, our, each of our research topics are kind of slightly different, although they do tie in together quite nicely. So I think to start off, I'm just going to go through a bit about the basic overview of the species, and then we can get into our research topics and show you some of the pre preliminary results which we have so far. So now that I know that everyone here hasn't seen a ground hornbill, um, I hope that all of you at some stage do get to see one, but for those of you who don't, this is what they this is what they look like. Um, they're very large black birds, as you can see, and they an adult will weigh roughly about four kilograms and stand about one meter off the ground. They're also entirely fornivorous, so this just means that they eat in the entirety of an animal. So they won't just eat the meat, for example; they'll eat the whole thing, and they'll pretty much eat everything that, that they can overpower, including insects, reptiles, amphibians, other birds, and even small mammals. They live in groups, um, which they occupy large territories of about 100 square kilometers, and they have extremely long lifespans, living between 50 to 60 years old in the wild. So as you can expect, often with these, these long-lived species, they have a very low reproductive productivity because they can, you know, they can pick and choose when they when they want to they want to breed. And when they when they do breed, they'll lay two eggs, but only a single chick survives. This is because, as you can see from, from this picture, and I'll I'll play the little video now, but the eggs hatch at, at different stages. So it's about five days difference between the eggs hatching. And you can see the one is smaller than the other. And pretty much what happens is just the one outcompetes the other and the other one dies. So 99% of the time, the smaller chick will die and the group will raise a single chick. I mentioned already that they live in, in groups, but they're also cooperative breeders. What, uh, what this means is that the entire group will help in the raising of the, of, of the offspring. So for ground hornbills, they live in groups of which range from two to 11 individuals. Uh, within each of these groups, there is an alpha pair, which are the breeders, obviously. You can see from these two pictures, uh, you can tell that the males, you can tell them apart pretty much. The males have a solid red throat, whereas the females have blue on the throat as well. Then there are several helpers of various ages, <clears throat> some related and some unrelated. From the pictures here, we work from the youngest with a very pale, pale coloration and then move towards the subadults, which show some coloration, but it's still very patchy until they reach maturity at about six to eight years old. It's also important for me to just note here that there is only a single adult female within each ground hornbill group. So even if the groups are made up of 10 birds, there's still only one female. She's, she's pretty much the boss and has the say. A lot of my research focuses on this fact and the fact that these birds are cooperative breeders. So I'll be talking a little bit more about it later on, but for now, I'm just gonna continue with uh, the species itself. They're distributed from the equator south down to where we are here in South Africa, indicated by the red in this picture. Unfortunately, in South Africa, they are listed as endangered. In, throughout their range, they are vulnerable, but in the country they've lost about 70% of the historic range in the past 100 years. This is mostly due to habitat loss, lack of nesting sites, persecutions, mostly human causes as usual. Um, there's also one other species of ground hornbill. You can see in this picture in the, in the blue, the northern or Abyssinian ground hornbill. It's the only other species within the Bukovis genus. 
Uh, Bucorvus, out of interest sake, it means large crow-like bird. So you can kind of get, get why it's, it's named after that. Um, the northern birds are slightly smaller and their throat coloration looks more like a, a metallic blue than anything else. And uh, yeah. And as the name suggests, they occur north of the of the, the range of southern ground hornbills. There is a slight overlap, but as far as I know, they don't regularly, they haven't, they don't really get seen in the same areas. So the area we work in is, is South Africa, obviously, in the northeastern parts, in an area known as the APNR, or the Associated Private Nature Reserves. This consists of private, private, five privately owned reserves, the Kassiri, Timbavati, Mbubat, Thornybush, and Baluli, and they're all on the boundary of Kruger National Park. Altogether, they make up about 200,000 hectares, and it's it's very much the same habitat as Kruger, uh, as there's no fences between them. So in short, it's still a very wild place and there's a high diversity of, of game. Um, you can see these pictures. I mean, they just showed some giraffes and, and rhinos and stuff, but there's, um, there's a wide variety of things. Um, so within the study site, uh, the APNR Ground Hornbill Project, which is us, run by the Fitzpatrick Institute, uh, has been here for the past, in the study site, uh, for the past 20 years, uh, doing research and conservation on the species, uh, where we've seen a number of researchers uh, come through and contribute. So when the project first started, it was noticed very quickly that there was a lack of nesting sites. The birds naturally nest in tree cavities, rock faces, and sometimes earth banks, but because of the lack of these in the area, artificial nests were installed very early on in the project and it saw massive success uh, the birds happily took took to them and since then we've been installing these nests strategically throughout the study site and even outside of the study the study site because it just helps to grow the population then obviously with us knowing where the nests were located it provided the perfect opportunity to actually monitor the nests and monitor the breeding of the birds and conduct all sorts of research to try and understand the, the species better and ultimately contribute towards their conservation. These days, a great deal of our research is done through the use of camera traps. Their breeding cycles are extremely long, about 135 days long to be exact. So we obviously can't sit at every single nest and watch them day in and day out for that entire period. It's just unfeasible. So cameras provide the perfect tool for us to do this. It's largely un uninvasive, and for the most part, it allows us to see the private lives of the birds in their natural behavior. All the footage we get is, is in video format, so as you can imagine, we can investigate a wide variety of things, including feeding rates, social interactions, vocalizations, predation events, anything we can think of that the videos show, pretty much. So I got a, I got a little example here, obviously. Um, it's some great example of the footage we get, and I'm going to play it for you, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what's going on. some very perplexed looking birds. Um, but so from this video, we can see a number of, of different things. First of all, we can see that all the different group members are there. On the perch at the bottom, on the far left is, is the female, which is close to the nest, and she's, she has the blue throat, which as I mentioned, she's gonna be, this is the dominant female and the only adult female within the group. Then there's the alpha male next to her with a food parcel, which is obviously likely gonna feed that that chick that was whining in the nest that you could hear. And then there was on the far right, there's last year's chick. Um, so this footage actually, it really helps us to see survival of these chicks as well. I mean, so from this video, we can tell, okay, this chick is still alive and kicking, running around with the group. Then finally, there's a helper on top of the nest who's just sitting there like a king. As I mentioned, it also provides us with information on predation events. I've added, it, uh, I've added it here just more out of interest. It's not really something we're investigating with our research, um, but it is something that goes into a big database. We've always assumed that leopards are likely 
culprits of, of nest failing. But this footage gave us some definitive proof that it's happening. And it's been it's the first time it's been caught on video that we know of, at least. Um, it's unfortunate that the chick died, obviously, but uh, at the end of the day, it's nature. Um, and this video at least helps us to gather information on why nests might fail. So you can see at the end there, the leopard jumped into the nest and then it turned around and started hissing at something. Uh, it, it was actually hissing at the adult birds who were present and were actually trying to chase the leopard away, um, but they were obviously unsuccessful. Uh, so now that we know a little bit more about the birds and the things which we as a project do, I'm gonna dive a bit more into my PhD research and share some of the results uh, we have found so far. Firstly, just to mention all the help from my supervisors, Rita, Fanny, and Claire, and all the help from Chloe, Tundi, and Carrie, obviously, to get this point. It's definitely been a team effort. And obviously, the FITS and National Geographic Society for their funding, specifically for my research. I mentioned earlier that birds live in so the bird social structures and then being cooperative breeders. So my research is looking a bit more more into this cooperation and is titled the individual contributions towards group behavior in ground hornbills. So cooperation. Uh, I know there was a talk a few weeks ago on this as well, but I'm going to give another recap. It, it occurs in all obviously group living species and it's, it's common throughout the animal kingdom. It's been shown to occur in birds, insects, fish, mammals, more, you know, and, you know everything. Uh, humans are probably the best example where cooperation occurs, as I'm sure you all know. We often cooperate to achieve a mutual goal. But it's also intriguing, this cooperation, because the effort that individuals put in might benefit the group, but it comes at an individual cost. And I put in an example here that my supervisor, Rita, used a few months ago. Um, if you, I highly recommend that you go and watch her presentation as well. It's very interesting. Um, here we have a group of, of sociable weavers trying to chase away a Cape Cobra from their nest. So collectively, they might be successful in chasing the snake away from this nest, which, which will benefit the group as a whole, but it comes at an individual cost. Here, obviously, the cost would be being caught by the snake. And then when we look at reproduction, um, and with cooperative breeding, individuals forego their own reproduction to provide energetically costly help to, to others. And this makes us question its stability, since why would individuals remain in groups if they were bearing the cost pretty much? And at the end of the day, it comes down to understanding what the costs and benefits are to the individuals. And put simply, the benefits to the individuals need to outweigh the costs for it to be maintained. To research these, though, these costs and benefits, we need to look at who is actually contributing within these groups and how much each of them are contributing. So the aim of my, my research is, invest, is to investigate the social structures within the species and to understand the individual contributions towards territory defense and reproduction. Uh, these these uh, group functions are actually vital for, for survival in the species, and so I'm investigating them. Uh, I've got another little video here. Uh, it shows a few different things, which I'm again going to talk mention after it plays. <laughs> So firstly, uh, we're able to see all the individuals within the group again. Um, then you can see that some birds have food in their beaks for the chick inside the nest that they're going to feed. So they're at a cost here because essentially they're providing for the chick rather than eating the food themselves, even if that, that chick is not their own offspring. So why would they provide food and not eat, eat the food themselves? The second thing you might have noticed, if if you all, if the video worked like I had hoped, 
is that there was a lot of vocalizations happening in in between the different individuals. And this brings me to my next point. Communication is key. It's key for vital and survival in, in, the, in survival and reproduction in any species, pretty much. Many species throughout the animal kingdom will, will use communication as a means to uh, maintain territories which they will actively defend. Uh, the reasons they defend them is because they secure access to crucial resources, resources such as food, breeding and nesting sites, uh, mating opportunities, and shelters. So the territory owners will frequently use communication, whether it be acoustic, visual, or olfactory, which is smell, as a way to actually discourage intruders from entering. By using these, they can actually prevent physical defense and save themselves the cost of being harmed. It allows them to assess whether the threat of intruders is actually serious or not. When we look at birds and ground hornbills in this case, um, vocalizations are used as their primary means to advertise and defend these territories. With this, the ability to recognize the vocalizations of others provides the opportunity to save both time and energy. It's been studied in many bird species, which looked into the, whether individuals could recognize neighbors from strangers. Uh, what I mean by this is, so if we have a bird, yeah, this target bird, um, neighbors will be close in the adjacent territories, whereas strangers will be further from it, further off. So the target bird or group or whatever will be a bit more accustomed, accustomed to the calls of neighbors since they'll likely have heard them before, whereas the stranger calls are a lot more unfamiliar to the target. From this, there's been many studies that have shown something which is known as the, the deer enemy phenomenon, where individuals respond to the calls of strangers more aggressively to, to the calls of neighbors. This is because they potentially pose a more serious threat um, to the birds. A good example of this is, is of green wood hoopers by Radford. Green wood hoopers also occur in, in our study site here. And in his research, he showed that these birds actually responded more aggressively to the calls of, of stranger groups than to that, than that of neighbor groups. So ground hornbills are, for those of you who managed to watch the little video when we were in the waiting room there, um, they're very well known for, for their vocalizations, uh, deep booming vocalizations, which they perform every morning. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have heard them before, but those of you who haven't, this is a bit what it sounds like. You can see it's this very deep, call that they produce and it's, it's usually about between four to six notes that these these calls occur the reason why these vocalizations though, are so well known is because they use them as a means for long distance between group communication and territory defense as i mentioned earlier their territories are extremely large so it's likely to be several kilometers between the, between the groups uh, and deep vocalizations account for this because low frequency calls actually travel further. It was just to give you a kind of idea of what, what happens. Um, but while these calls are very well known, they've never actually been analyzed in detail and we don't really know what information they support, who is contributing, and what the functions actually are. So we recorded the calls of 10 different groups within our study site to analyze these calls. And very quickly, the first thing we noticed was that it was mainly the adults and occasionally the sub-adults who contribute towards these territory calls. We then looked at if there were any differences in the calls of males and females, since it might provide more information on group composition. Uh, what we found is that there is. Um, in the graph on the left here, you can see in the pink, this is the female calls. In the turquoise, that is the male calls. On the y-axis here, we have the frequency, and then you can clearly see that the female calls are at a slightly higher frequency to that of the males. 
The picture on the right is, is very similar, except it's got the length of the calls. Um, there isn't much of a difference, maybe slightly longer calls uh, in that of males. Uh, the next picture I'm showing you is, is, is a bit more complicated, but it just combines these two last graphs, which I showed, with having frequency on the y-axis and duration on the x-axis. Uh, and then we get this line here that we can draw between the two um, with purple, or pink, or purple, pink, whatever, still being the, the females and the turquoise being blue. And it just pretty much show this line pretty much shows that there's a 92% accuracy when determining the sex between these calls. So when groups perform these territorial calls, listening groups might be, actually be able to determine how many males and how many females are with within the group. But we already know that there's only a single adult female within the groups. And so if they can recognize her call, then they should be able to recognize the group. However, for any recognition to occur, the performing call must contain some kind of signature. To put it differently, there needs to be something unique in the call that allows them to be identified. Uh, a good example is if I take my voice, for example, my voice is unique to me and can be identified. The group is the similar thing. So if the female has a signature, then recognition can actually occur. Now I'll put this graph here. And again, it's a bit complicated, um, but essentially what it shows is the syllables within a female call uh, with, with the frequency here, the fundamental frequency on the y-axis and the length on the x-axis. A ground hornwall territorial call looks like this uh, when you put it in a waveform. And you can see that it's made up of these, these different parts here. You can see one, two, three, four, five. And this is, this is the different syllables in the call. I mentioned syllables earlier. Um, the easiest way to explain it is very much like syllables in our words. If I, if I use the word vocalizations, for example, there's a number of different syllables, vocalizations. Um, and it's the exact same thing here uh, with each color representing a different syllable. So the blue, for example, is the first syllable. Uh, the orange is the second syllable and the rest are the rest of the syllables. So this call that we're looking at here is actually the call from, from a single female from one group. And when we compare this call to the calls of other females, we can very quickly see that each of them have their own unique pattern or melody. So this confirms actually that the chorus calls of these females contain signatures, which you know, it allows for recognition. So we know that they have unique calls. But again, this is just the first step because just because, a, just because a call has a unique signature does not actually mean that others are able to recognize it. So to investigate this, we're using carefully constructed playback experiments where we simulate territorial intrusions. Uh, and I must just highlight here, it's very carefully constructed playback experiments to, to minimize any effect. Um, so what we do is we arrive at the nesting sites before sunrise and our little camouflage tent uh, with our speaker and we sit a few hundred meters away from from the nest and then we just pretty much hide and, and wait for the birds to arrive. Once they arrive we then we then play the, their neighbor calls to them so the calls that they they're familiar with and we'll watch how they respond. After that we'll play the calls of strangers to them and see if they respond differently. If they do respond more, more or differently to or more aggressively to one or the other, then it, prov it provides us with evidence that they can in fact recognize the signatures of others. These experiments also allow us to, to look at who's actually contributing in, in the physical defense of, the, of their territories. Unfortunately, we're not quite finished with these experiments yet. Uh, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. But what we have noticed so far is that the juveniles do not contribute at all and they actually hide away when there's any kind of intrusion. 
so if we play a call and there's a juvenile it'll just disappear instantly and go walk on the ground and hide in the bush the reason for this is the crazy fact that that kidnapping actually occurs within the species so during a ter ter territorial intrusions it's been known that an uh, intruding group will go and actually escort uh, the juveniles into their groups and, and claim them so them hiding away is, is probably a way to to just avoid this so to sum up with the, the territorial defense in the species we first know that they use chorus calls as a means of territorial defense and that mostly the adults contribute to this and occasionally the subadults we then know that the calls differ between the sexes and that the female calls contain signature melodies, which are unique to the individuals, which lays the platform for them, platform for them to recognize one another. Then when it comes to physical defense, we know that the juveniles do not contribute at all. And then the final step that we need to do is actually to see whether they are able to recognize neighbors from strangers. <laughs> Little joke, eh? So moving into the other section of, of my research, the reproduction, I've put this video here just to demonstrate how we can actually investigate how helpers and individuals contribute towards reproduction. And although this video shows the breeding female, the helpers also exhibit this behavior. <laughs> So really a great video there where you can see a very excited chick getting getting some food. Um, so from these videos though, we can analyze which particular individuals are coming, how much they're bringing, what they're bringing, the time of day, the food they bring, et cetera, et cetera. So as I mentioned, during the breeding, the, the group will come and feed. Um, they'll either feed the female in the nest who's, who has the sole responsibility of incubating or the resulting chick inside. Um, what we found so far, our initial results have shown that individuals of different ages contribute to varying degrees. So the adults will feed almost 3.3 times a day. The subadults will feed a bit less at about 1.6 times a day. And then the juveniles contribute next to nothing with an average of 0 0.3 times today. So we can see that the individuals all provision at different rates, um, but there's something else which might affect this, this feeding rate of these birds. And it's at this point where Carrie's work begins to tie in with mine, and that is temperature. Ground hornbills live in areas where it's often very hot. Um, our study site during the breeding season can regularly go over 40 degrees, being very uncomfortable for for everyone, including the birds. So as you could imagine, during the early mornings or on cool days, you would expect individuals to feed at a pretty decent rate. But as it gets hotter, you may, it may become a bit more difficult for the birds to provision. Um, much like all of us, when it's a really hot day, it's, things become a little bit more uh, lumbersome. So we would expect that these feeding rates would, would decrease as temperatures decrease, increase. And this is exactly what um, our preliminary results have indicated. Uh, you don't need to focus too much on this graph, but the red line here pretty much just shows that uh, there's a decrease in, in feeding rates with increasing temperatures. So it makes you wonder, um, how do they then still manage to provide for the chick inside the nest if it's if it's a really hot summer, so, you know, lots of days over 40 degrees, for example? Well, cooperative breeding might be the answer. Studies on other species, such as uh, my supervisor Rita's uh, sociable weaver research, has shown that actually having helpers helps to buffer the effects of harsh conditions. So because there are more individuals, they were able to compensate and help out where it might be a struggle to an individual. This is uh, common in, in humans, as all of us will know, when a family man, member is struggling, we'll all work together um, and contribute and, and compensate. 
we're all aware of the current climate crisis, uh, rising temperatures, changes in rainfall patterns, increases in extremes, and all of them are going to push uh, species to their limits. But understanding how this, how species respond or may be affected by these changes has become of massive importance, both to grasp how environments might be affected and also what we can do to conserve them. So I've started investigating this using the project's long-term data, as I mentioned, we've been going since for 21 years now, somewhere along those lines. Um, and I'm looking at to see how temperature and rainfall affects the different aspects of breeding. We would expect that seasons of extreme temperatures or low rainfall would probably decrease the success rate since, well, it's been shown in a number of species ac across the world. Um, then we looked at additionally, if the helpers actually managed to buffer these harsh conditions over the years. Our results have shown quite a few different things. Um, here, I'm just gonna highlight a few of them, uh, the ones that are clearest and most robust. And the first thing that we found was that, was that there was no buffering effect from helpers. So they did not compensate when conditions were harsh. We also found that as shown in these two graphs here, yeah, that the presence of juveniles and subadults, subadults increases the chances of groups breeding. But since we kind of know that in that that juveniles don't really contribute, they contribute very little actually, it's likely that it represents breeding experience more than anything else. Um, then when we look, we move on to rainfall, we also found a correlation with higher winter rainfall and breeding probability. Uh, winter here is usually quite a dry period. Um, and when there's more rainfall, pretty much, it's, it's most likely to increase the food availability in the area, which then has a positive effect on, on the breeder's body condition, and so they're more likely to breed. This next result is, is displayed in this graph, and it's a bit more complicated because it shows both temperature and rainfall. In short, what it's showing is that there's interaction with rainfall and temperature on when groups are likely to lay their first egg. Uh, you don't need to focus too much on it. Uh, what it. The gist of what it says is that hot, wet winters correlate with later breeding periods. However, cool, wet winters correlate with earlier laying periods. And the reason is for this is a bit tricky, but it most likely comes down to humidity playing a role and, and the breeder's body condition. Then finally, and this is where Carrie's research really starts to tie in, is that we found a correlation between temperature and chick mass. Hotter maximum temperatures over the breeding period were associated with chicks being lighter. So not a, not a good sign. Um, and it, in summary, the, this research shows that you know, the birds are actually vulnerable to climate, and the climate changing, harsh conditions. Uh, especially with the absence of any buffering effect from, from the helpers. And, and it's at this point where I'm now going to let Carrie take over, where she's going to delve a little bit more into, into these effects. And yeah, enjoy. Okay, thanks, Kyle. Um, I hope you're all still with us. <laughs> so I'm going to talk to you briefly about my research on the effect of high temperatures on the nestling growth and physiology. And it's going to be more about my methods and, and why we're doing this. I, I don't quite have, have results to show yet. Now, this research is done through the Fitzpatrick Institute of, at the University of Cape Town as part of the Hot Birds Research Project with the help of my lovely supervisors, Rita Kovas and Susie Cunningham as well as with the help of our friend Tundi, who's been amazing at helping me with extracting data from the camera traps. And of course, Kyle, um, who's an expert ladder carrier <laughs> <laughs> and helps me with everything in the field. So what effect do high temperatures have on nestlings and other bird species? <clears throat> Many other studies on this have been done on birds in hot and arid areas hence the desert landscape in the background, where higher temperatures in an already hot <laughs> climate are often shown to lead to a decrease in nestling growth rates and body condition. 
This can be because the nestling is investing more energy into regulating its own temperature rather than into its growth. And it's also likely that the nestlings receiving less food from the parents or the other adult birds as they attend to their own needs on hotter days. The adult birds may need, themselves need to spend time in the shade rather than foraging for food. And also uh, food might just be less available on, at hotter times. A, a nice study done by Tanya van de Ven on yellow-billed hornbills in the Southern Kalahari uh, found exactly this, that when the mean maximum temperature experienced by the nestling was high, then their body mass at fledging tended to be less than those who experienced lower temperatures. And you can see that in this, this graph there. So the nestlings experiencing the higher temperatures had, had a poorer body condition. And this can have carryover effects, reducing the bird's lifetime fitness and subsequent breeding success. It can also uh, lead to a, a decrease in the survival rate with some nestlings not even fledging at all. And uh, Tanya also found this, that the, the probability of nestlings fledging decreased when these chicks experienced very high temperatures. So on this graph, the, the zeros along the bottom are nest failures and the ones on the top are nest successes, fledging successes. And you can see when you get above uh, 37 degrees, there's, there's really no no um, successful attempts. So to, so to do this, Tanya looked at uh, how the maximum air temperature affected the bird's provisioning rate. And she also investigated the actual temperature inside the nest and how this all linked to the outcome of the nestling's mass and nest success. And she found that the nest temperature played the biggest role in this pathway. And we're going to go back to ground hornvilles now and, and back to Kyle's findings where he saw the similar trend in ground hornville nestlings, where higher temperatures had a negative effect on the mass of the nestlings. So I want to look at this uh, in much more detail and to a finer scale. Uh, so in order to do this, we need to weigh and measure these chicks. And this is myself and Kyle in the field. We've got a a chick in the bag we're weighing at. This is a 75 day old chick, so it's just about ready to fledge. And we take different measurements of tarsus, head, wing, and so on. And we do this at different, different ages from one day old all the way through to 75 days old. And we just do this at six different stages. And then we can create a, a, a growth curve, which we have here with every triangle being an individual chick. And you can really see how rapidly these nestlings grow from a tiny pink nestling in the hand at around 100 grams to these beautiful blue-eyed birds at three kilograms in just 75 days. It's quite amazing. So going back to this pathway, uh, with this, we know these uh, nestling measurements now and we can piece the rest together. So we get uh, data from local weather stations. We look at the camera traps and, and get the provisioning rates and the food brought. We install uh, temperature loggers inside every nest to get hourly temperature readings. So that's what the, the chick is actually experience, experiencing in the nest. And we combine all of this information uh, to, get, to get a better idea as what, to what has the biggest impact on the nestling's growth and nest success. And if, like the yellow-billed hornbills, it's the nest temperature that's playing the biggest role, then this is actually something we can help the birds with as we provide the birds with artificial nests. Um, as Kyle mentioned, ground hornbills are cavity nesting birds but the conservation of the species is, is hugely reliant on providing these birds with artificial nests. On the left, um, this is one of our artificial nests. In the middle is a, a natural nest, which in our study site, we actually only have, have one that's, that's used. Um, and these, these natural cavities are really hard to come by for these birds in South Africa, and just due to human expansion and habitat destruction. 
And the Mabula Ground Hornbill project have been coming up with new nest designs and nest materials and have been providing nests for us for the past few years, like this one on the right. And we've been working with them in order to provide the, the birds with the best possible nest design that will be climate proof into the future. And we also just make sure we, we put these nests into nice shady canopies just to give them the best chance. Another important thing to look at is, is how the rest of the group are coping with high temperatures. The ground hornbills spend most of their day walking on the ground, foraging for food. So they're exposed to a lot of direct sun as well as the hot ground surface actually radiating back to them. And um, also another thing to note is these birds feed during the, the hottest time of the year during the hot summer when, when, most, when food is most abundant. Now, ground hornbills have a number of ways in which they can regulate their body temperature and stay cool. And a, a study by Andries Janssen van Furen looked at how the beak and facial skin act as heat regulators. And now this is a non-evaporative cooling method where heat can be lost by adjusting the blood flow to these areas. In Andries' thermal imaging pictures of, of ground hornbills, as temperatures increase, you can see the beak and the facial skin changing color from purple in the top picture, when the surrounding air temperature is relatively cool, to orange and yellow as the air temperature increases and blood flow to these areas increase. And the, the graph also just shows the, the surface temperature of the beak increasing as the air temperature increases and it actually becomes hotter than the surrounding air temperature. And they can amazingly dissipate up to 75% of basal metabolic rate this way. And this, this is also seen in, in other hornbills and is also known in toucans. And there are a number of other ways in which they, they can cool down. They can, they can retreat into sh cooler shady microsites, usually up into a tree. They may wing droop, fluff out their feathers to increase the airflow to the skin. Uh, they will also pant to allow for evaporative cooling. And then we, we also see this deflated facial skin when there's a decrease of blood flow to that area. And we've been noticing them doing this on hot and cold days. So they must be minimizing both heat gain and heat loss by doing this. And uh, something else picked up by Andres's uh, thermal imaging was this nasal watering. And it's sometimes seen at very high temperatures and it seems to result in localized cooling of the beak. And the birds were often seen rubbing this on their wing feathers, which, which probably aids them in, to cool down in another way. Um, so to look at the, how the rest of the group who are feeding the nestling, uh, how they're coping with hot days, we, we go back to our amazing camera traps again. And we can record what the birds are doing in terms of these heat dissipation behaviours when they arrive at the nest to feed the nestling. And you can see once this male has fed the chick in the nest, he opens up his wings and he, he begins to pant. So he can start, he, once he's delivered that food, he can offload heat. And this bird, it's hard to see, but he's actually showing signs of this nasal watering. And this was on a particularly hot time of day, over 36 degrees. And here's another example. Um, and it just shows you that these, these birds are facing substantial trade-offs on hot days. The male has made a choice to feed the nestling rather than eat the food himself. And this can be very costly to him as he's used up a lot of energy foraging and hunting in the heat. And he's lost a lot of, probably lost a lot of water to evaporative cooling. And he hasn't actually gained the food reward for himself. And it's also important that we look at what the birds are doing away from the nest while foraging and even out of the breeding season. In winter here in the low field, these birds are often dealing with days above 30 degrees. And this might have an effect on their body condition as they spend energy trying to stay cool in a time when there's less food available. And this video was sent to us from a guide and a videographer in the area. 
And what was really nice for us to see was, was this young juvenile here. Um, we'd actually monitored this, this juvenile throughout that, that nesting period. And it was so nice to see that it was still alive and, and with the group at this stage, a few months after fledging. So we've decided that, that using citizen science like this is actually a great way for us to gather more information for a more robust study where guides, rangers, um, the public can submit photos and videos to us. And we can look at these photos and videos and record the location and any heat dissipation behaviors seen. And then we can also pull in the temperature data from, from local weather stations. And we've distributed this poster around the reserves and on social media. And we've had a really great response so far and we're super grateful for to everyone who's sent in pictures and videos, but we do need more, so please keep them coming. If anyone visits Cougar regularly, then, then you can send, it, send any pictures to us. And uh, not only does it help us with this particular study, but it contributes towards the nationwide monitoring of the species. And here are some examples of some really nice pictures we've been getting, mainly from Kruger. Kruger birds are just a lot less skittish than, than APNR birds, and they're more used to cars and people. Um, so you can get some really nice, nice pictures of them. Um, and this is quite a striking image of a, a bird, a female bird collapsed under a tree, and she's obviously struggling on an incredibly hot day, it's around 39 degrees. Um, and she has collapsed to the ground in the shade and it was probably that the ground was kind of a cooler area and she was just trying to cool her body temperature by, by laying down on the ground. And she's at risk of, of not only hyperthermia as she struggles to maintain her body temperature, but she's also very vulnerable to predation in this state. And so we kind of hope that this research will help us understand the heat tolerance of these birds and whether it'll be able to continue to persist and reproduce in a warming world. And to kind of sum up both mine and Kyle's and studies, I know it's a lot of information to take in. Um, it's basically that cooperation comes at a cost to the individuals. Individuals within the group contribute differently to territory defense and reproduction. And the birds are vulnerable to climate change as the helpers do not seem to buffer the negative effects of harsh conditions. And this research will provide us with the very first insight into the physiological stresses on ground hornbill nestlings. And hopefully it will give us improved guidance on the conservation needs of the species and how to mitigate climate change effects through direct conservation actions so that we can continue to see these birds in, well into the future. Um, so that's about it. Thank you very much for listening and a huge thank you to all the institutes, funders, collaborators, the reserves that we work in for allowing us to work there. And um, we really couldn't do this, this research and this project without them. So, so thank you very much and thank you, Derek, for inviting us. You are most welcome. And if anybody has questions, please just pop them in the chat. We are a little bit too many people for, for open mic. I think it will just become confusing. Uh, but if anybody would like to uh, speak, just uh, click the raise to raise your hand um, under the reactions uh, icon, I think it is. Yes, raise hand. And uh, we'll see if we can unmute you. So thanks a lot. Um, for a really wonderful presentation. And uh, it's really interesting to see this. Um, there is uh, a question in the chat that I'll just pick up now. Um, what happens to the females that don't become dominant female in a group? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. And it is, it's one of the mysteries of the species because as far as we know, when they hatch, it's, it's a 50-50 ratio. So if there's an egg, there's a 50% chance of it being a male or female. Uh, if it is a female, usually they get ejected from the group within, or they naturally disperse themselves within the first year 
Um, and then they, I mean, they wander around on their own for a large period of time. We've got, we've got one case in this area where a bird disappeared or, or left a group very young and disappeared for about 10 years. And then all of a sudden just popped up again in a breeding group and, and started breeding. But it's, it's, it's few and far between. There, there have been all female groups recorded uh, in Kruger, but us, we've, we've never seen anything of the sort. I think it's really rare. One more question. Uh, other than mitigating, oops, sorry, the chat jumped. Uh, other than mitigating climate change, which is monumental, is there anything that can be done to help them during the hottest times of the year? Um, unfortunately, not really. Like like you say, climate change is such a monumental thing. It's there's nothing uh, the the general public can do to help the birds, the ground hornbills anyway. But with your your garden birds, you can make sure you have a nice bird bath for the the birds to cool off and drink. Uh, ground hornbills don't drink water, so so that's not going to help them. So. Yeah, it's not really anything. I mean, just spread the word, can continue doing your bit for the environment, I suppose. But yeah, that's why it's really important to do this, this research and just to find out what their heat tolerances are and, and how we can best, um, best protect them in the future. So I'm going to sneak in a question of my own. This, uh, in this uh, uh, cooperative behavior, is there anybody who's looked at the genetics of it with hornbills? It is, it is unfortunately one of the, I don't want to say shortcomings, but because it sounds bad, but uh, one of the shortcomings of my research is that it's the genetics. Uh, it's just a really, really difficult thing to tell. Um, obviously, to get genetics, you need, to, you need to either get a blood sample or get a feather or something, or, and a lot of that is often catching birds. But with ground hornbills, they're extremely smart, and you can catch them once, but catching them again is a whole different ball game. So, yeah, maybe one day in the future, but I don't think I don't think we're quite there yet. Yeah. Okay. No, that makes uh, that makes sense. But it would be really interesting to know oh. what the what the you know how how related they all are. Yeah. Absolutely. And I mean, we started you know, a collection. We started a collection of feathers to start building this, but it's still yeah. That's a long term thing. Sure. Long term thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, let me see, I've just, I have been helping the Mabula Groundbill Hornbill Project with sightings in the Eastern Cape. Uh, that's from Lynette. Uh, she's created an album in the Eastern Cape Birding Group with sightings. She'd be happy to share it with you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. That really Lynette. helps us. We work really closely with uh, the Mabula Ground Hornbill Project. Um, so if she has shared them with them, then that's great. But yeah, we'd also love to see them. Um, Allison is asking roughly how many hornbills are being raised at Mabula? Uh, how successful is it in returning them to the wild? So I'm sure there's a lot of people here who don't really know what Mabula does. Um, they, they are focused purely on, on the conservation of the species. And what they do, they have a really successful project. Uh, as I mentioned that the birds lay two eggs and then the one chick dies. So before that chick dies, that chick gets taken out of the nest and then it goes to, to Mabula Ground Hornbill Project where then they, they then raise the chicks and then release them back into the wild. Um, it's very carefully monitored. Um, they, don't take, they don't take as many as they can get kind of thing. So it all depends on how much space they have in their aviaries. It also takes really long for, for this to happen. I mean, with birds only becoming mature at about six to eight years old they're only taking you know, five to ten birds a year um, on average so so yeah but for the exact number there is at the moment i i don't know um swati is asking what methods and tools did you use for estimation of the bird of the bird what I'll leave it to you guys to interpret it. <laughs> um, I don't know. <laughs> estimation of the bird. Uh, Swati, can you clarify? Can you clarify yeah. what you mean? Estimation of the bird what? <laughs> can estimate a lot of things if you want. 
<laughs> Meanwhile, we'll move on to uh, to help uh, prevent um, predation by leopards. Could tree barriers be placed around the tree? Um, I'm just curious in relation to that question, how common is leopard predation? It's a really it's a really difficult thing to tell. Like I, like I mentioned, the breeding periods are extremely long. So for for us to monitor them with camera traps throughout that period, we're obviously going to be using a lot of a lot of batteries in our camera traps. So we usually put them up in periods, um, not through the entire cycle of the breeding. But I would say at least we usually have on average between 10 to 15 groups breeding each year. And I would guess that at least one or two get taken yeah, each year. And us usually we, we never know the, the nestling's just gone and we just have to presume. Or we look um, for signs yeah. around, around the nest. So that's um, what was really nice about that camera trap being up at the right time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we caught what happened. So I think it does happen more often than, than what we thought. But um, in terms of tree barriers, um, yeah, I mean, theoretically it, it can be done, but at the end of the day, we, we are in a very natural area and the birds are doing well in this area. So it's, it's part of nature and it's, it's actually a food source for the leopards at the end of the day. So they're not having a, a huge impact on, on the breeding success in our area. So at this point, I think we'll probably just, just leave it. Yeah, and you, I don't think you can actually prevent a leopard from getting up a tree. I think they'll find a way. That's also true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Genets, genets also predate them. So yeah. if it's not, obviously when, they, when they're very small, but so yeah, and genets are very, very nimble little things. So. Please go ahead and ask your question, Rosie. Uh, yeah, hi Kyle, hi Carrie. Uh, nice to speak to you um, from uh, from sunny Scotland. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, going back to the, the the first question, and also I suppose talking about the female uh, there that we saw that was struggling with the heat. Um, if a female, the the, the female should um, uh, be lost, should be killed, whatever. Are we assuming there that that if the if the chick is not uh, fledged that that's the end of it that she she actually controls the the feeding or will it still survive with the rest of the group is the first part um, and how quickly if you like is there a, going to be a replace where do they find their replacement female and uh, secondly how do hornbills mix the gene pool if the only groups they've got are family groups so. I'll just start with with the first your second question and that it's, <laughs> it's not it's not entirely family family members so there are unrelated individuals the males okay. will also disperse and and mix into groups um as for the replacement of females i mean that's a a really difficult question because as i mentioned they live 50 to 60 years so <laughs> Even though our project's been going for 20 years now, we're probably still working on this on the same females kind of thing. We're probably still collecting data on the exact same females as when the project started 20 years ago. So when there is turnover, it's very few, few and far between and difficult for us to, to actually say. Sure. Occasionally, occasionally we uh, females have been known to like another female within the group, but I I put quotation marks on within the group because that other female will kind of just hang far back and kind of reap the rewards of, of being in a group, but doesn't actually get included with anything. Um, mm. Probably just holding on to the, the, the odd chance that uh, the female might die, the alpha female. Yeah. Right. Thanks very much. Pleasure. <laughs> I see you've put a uh, Swati. You've put your your. I should put my microphone on. Yes. <laughs> uh, Swati was asking the, about the tools and methods to count the greater hornbill in the region. The number the number of greater hornbills in the region. Yeah. So for for us in in our study site at least, it's we know all the nesting sites. We work in the area. 
most week like every day mm. almost so we've we've almost got an individual record now of, of all the different individuals within the area within south africa it's it's a much much bigger task um and that's where mabula comes into play they they run most of the nationwide conservation uh, or count rather and they use a whole bunch of they've, they've got champions that kind of head up the collecting of sightings in all different regions uh, within the country and stuff like that so it's it's largely down to citizen science at the end of the day and and mapping all the different groups and best guesstimate pretty much I presume that people who do bird lassing will will also exactly. have hornbills. Yeah. Yes, yeah. on bird lasser there is there is a set there is an option to submit to Mabula Ground Hornbill Project, so. and then they obviously put it into a map and try and identify which groups are where and how many individuals and yeah. But in South Africa, it's estimated that there's about a thousand five hundred birds uh, left. So that's it's roughly. 450 to 500 groups of birds. That's not a lot, eh? No, <laughs> by no means. And the vast majority of that is in our study site and, and Kruger National Park. Um, I, further north in Botswana, are, are there, it seems like I've seen a lot of ground hornbills in Botswana more than I've seen in South Africa. Are there more? Yeah, there or? yeah they, they yeah. do well in Botswana, Zambia. Higher density as well. Um, mm -hmm. There's parts of Zimbabwe, for example, that the average territory is about one every 16 square kilometers rather than 100 square kilometers. So it also comes down to, often comes down to cultural beliefs and whether they can live in communities and things like that, which often plays a big role. Okay, so I'm going to, there's one more question and that's from Val. How do the ground, bill, ground hornbills not drink water? <laughs> they, um, a, a lot of hornbills don't, don't actually drink. Um, they get all the water they need from the food they eat and they eat a lot of reptiles, which which gives them a lot of water, mammals. Um, so yeah, they, they don't need, they're not water dependent, which, which might be um, good for them in the, the ch climate change. But um, yeah, as long as they can get enough food to eat. I don't know if they'd be able to drink water in the first place with those beaks. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> It'd be really <laughs> tricky. <laughs> so I think that's, uh, that's a good place to call it a wrap. There's lots of really great uh, comments uh, people saying wonderful presentation, great presentation, thank you, and I'm inclined to agree with them. So uh, thank you very much for this, uh, for this webinar and uh, for taking the time to come and share your, your knowledge and your experience and your research with Learn the Birds. Well, thanks for having thanks. us. Yeah, great. Thank you. Really great stuff. And thanks everybody for coming. Hopefully we'll yeah. see you again uh, sometime soon. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, Derek. Thank Cheers. Bye, Bye everyone.